Jue Bei is a 23-year-old boy who describes most of our lives, living a corporate life and having no girlfriend on one fateful day, everything changes for him. Born on January 7th, Xu works in the sales department of a web advertising company. At the prime age of 23, he became too drunk and fell off the balcony, breaking multiple bones. Because Truck Kuhn decided to re-sign from his job. While he's thinking about how much of a dumbass he truly is and how many people he might have caused trouble to, he wakes up in what seems to be a cave. But he gets more stunned when he tries to get up because he's covered in weird black strings. Seems like someone Venom would do. As he rips the black stuff off of him, he is surprised to see that his hands and legs are all healed. But most importantly, he wonders why the heck he is lying in this place naked. He then goes to another place just to see a rubble of rocks covering the entrance. But after some research, he finds out that he's in an abandoned subway, but has no idea which place he's in. He then gets worried about what if he gets arrested for being naked in front of people, so he wants to get dressed before anything. But in a place like this, all you're going to find are spider webs. As he's thinking, something comes running at him from behind. While Shu thinks it's a person, and now he's going to be exposed as a pervert, it's actually a wolf coming at him from full force, wanting to eat him alive. Instead of running away, Shu is stunned in fear, thinking how the heck a wolf spawns in the middle of Tokyo. He thinks it's all a dream or maybe a CGI, perhaps a robot. The wolf starts aggressively biting Shu, and now he has had enough of life. As his hand is getting bitten, a solid sword comes out of his hands, penetrating the skull of this wolf and killing it. He passes out wondering if it's all a dream and that he's very hungry. While he's on the ground without any energy, he is thinking about this whole situation. He wonders how the hell he spawned a whole sword from his hand as he was never this powerful. He then wants to cook the wolf but has no place to start a fire. Damn, he must have been hungry as hell. Eight turns him into a mindless freak as Shu is now considering eating the whole wolf raw. But as he makes up his mind, he hears a cute voice from behind saying, <laughs> You aren't gonna squeak the sporangium! Truth be told, if I were in his shoes, I'd freak out more than that time I saw a wolf. Anyways, it is revealed to be a cute little squirrel with a diamond on its head, referring to Shu as Mr. Hunter. The squirrel then asks him whether he could let him squeak too. Chu gets so riled up that he screams in disbelief, but the squirrel punches his head saying that he would provoke all the beasts in this area. This squirrel has a unique lingo, but it seems like it is as hungry as Shu himself. So, Shu gets ready to properly hunt the wolf, and he starts by opening the belly. But as they are preparing the food, the squirrel instantly runs away, saying that some other beasts are squeaking here fast. Both go even deeper into the tunnel, but as they are running, Shua literally grabs the balls of the wolf and both have to eat them. Shu takes a bite and gets a crazy tingling sensation in his body, but back there, it's the only danger because new beasts are coming. That tingling sensation is his leveling up, which the squirrel explains as his body's kinshi expanding. As they are walking in the metro station, the little squirrel also levels up, and he wonders if even squirrels have a leveling system now. I guess squirrels love watching solo leveling too. But the squirrel says it is not a squirrel but a magical beast. It is revealed that the squirrel is the most famous carbunclo in the world, which is a mythical animal often associated with precious materials like gemstone. As Shubu eats more balls, he levels up even quicker. Carbunclo is surprised by his leveling abilities and thinks he's such a squeaking human. Now Shu is worried about where the hell he is. And as he's thinking about this whole situation, the Carbon Claw reveals its name to be Tamiko. Thank God we got to hear the name. He then asks Tamiko where they are and what year they are. Tamiko replies that they are at Utsuka Metro, which is so many levels deep underground and by calendar year, it should be the year 102. Tamiko then explains that the metro got destroyed 102 years ago, and the previous kingdom got squeaked into ruins. Now the old Tokyo is gone, and they call it the New Tokyo, which is also turned into the kingdom of Itakuri's people. Shu hears this story and can't believe all this stuff is happening around him. He thinks that everything is out of order. This is where he remembers something really important and disturbing. As he was lying on the hospital floor, he remembered that his parents had a hard time visiting him because the station was already full. On the day in the hospital, he remembers a huge earthquake that cut all of Tokyo's power. 
And if what Tamiko is saying is true, then the world might have already been destroyed and he is present 100 years after the Tokyo Collapse event. Both Tamiko and Shu think about how impossible it is for him to be preserved like that for over 100 years. But as he shows the sticky material he was found in, Tamiko explains that it is Kinyu, an ability that gives a person control over their kinshi. Tamiko then explains that there is a fungus inside of him, which he is quite grossed about, but that fungus is what lets him use this ability and control his kinshi. He then remembers what happened when he killed the wolf, and he then calls a sword out of his hand again, which instantly surprises him. But this time, the sword came all the way out, and even though it looked like an unpolished sword, it looked very sharp, as though it was ready to cut. That's where Tamako starts yapping again, saying that the hunters from the people of Aikutori use their fungal abilities to get resources from the metro. They eat the sporangium and grow stronger, becoming even stronger. Tamiko then explains that he has never really gone to the surface and only learned about the human language from his mother. He then tells Shuo that going to the surface would be impossible because he is such a weak little person in this vast metro. Why yeah, so man. weak? So weak. And if he isn't careful, he will get eaten by the metro beasts and become poop in no time. Moreover, to go on the surface, he would need to climb a lot of ladders and fight vicious beasts that are ready to devour him like he's their next target. Shu then asks if there's a possibility of another person coming down here, and Tamiko explains that it is just impossible. Tamiko tells him that Tamiko is excited to meet him because Shu Wu is the only human that even comes down here. As Shu gets discouraged, Tamiko gives him a lot of motivation to level up and become stronger, and he also tells him that they should get stronger so Tamiko itself can handle some Metro Beasts. It seems like Tamiko is quite excited, but that's when it is revealed that Tamiko is actually a female. Underground basement level 50, filled with some of the scariest beasts, here we have two beings stuck under rubble. He is stuck with his squirrel partner with a fungal sword as his best shot. Will they be able to get to the surface? And most importantly, can he finally get some goddamn clothes because he's been naked for the whole chapter? Let's find out. Right the next moment, Shu wakes up in what seems to be a hospital. He then becomes relieved that at everything he was seeing was a dream and that he's awake. The doctor and the nurse come to check up on him, and as soon as he asks the doctor when he will be discharged, he is stunned to know what he says next. The doctor replies to him that once he's sufficiently leveled up, only then he can leave. Then he wakes up again in the metro station with Tamiko greeting him good morning. They are at the 50th level of the Utsuka metro, which seems to be a vast labyrinth spreading deep under Tokyo. However, even though this is the deepest part of the metro, there's still light coming, which is quite surprising to him. As he gets thirsty, Tamiko makes plans to go to the oasis. They walk outside the tunnel they went in yesterday, and Shu finds out that the wolf he killed yesterday is turning out into some sort of a seed plot even though there's no light reaching it. However, Tamiko tells him that it's just a fungus ability to which Shu wonders if there are more fungus abilities aside from the two he can use. He then summons his sword just to be safe from the unknown enemies and both go towards the oasis. As they reach the oasis, Shu stunned to see how beautiful it is. Big plants, greenery, and nature everywhere. It feels more beautiful than anything he's ever seen. Then Shu takes a handful of water and drinks it. He is so thirsty that the water feels tastiest to him, giving him a sensation that he's never felt before. But this water seems a bit different. It's just too tasty. Tamiko is also having the time of her life and starts cleaning herself and the jewel on her forehead. He gets curious and asks her what that unique jewel on her forehead is. But interestingly enough, Tamiko has no idea what that is, and she simply says that her mother has it and maybe that's how squirrels are meant to be. That's when he decides to rub the jewel, and as sussy as it might seem, Tamiko seems to be enjoying it. After some time, they decide to go get some food, but in a metro station like this with monsters lurking everywhere, maybe not the best move. Ju is stunned to see so many unique plants all over the place, some of which he has never even seen. Tamiko then tells Shuo about an edible plant and one that should never be eaten. Shu then looks around to see the unique properties of the plants in this area and how they can be used to make valuable materials for survival. He looks at a withered glass that looks so smooth and he thinks that if he collects enough of it, he can make a bed for himself. 
He then finally finds a big leaf and creates a cloth for himself, and finally, we won't have to see him naked for the next thousand chapters. He asks Tomiko if she senses any animals or monsters nearby, but Tomiko explains that they don't come here quite often. After this conversation, both Tomiko and Shu spent a lot of time setting up a base, an area of food, and a bed, and just became comfortable with being in this shady metro. He even made a stone knife, but one challenge remained. It's really difficult to draw fire due to a lack of resources. But while Shu is doing his stuff, he instantly catches a mouse coming its way. But here, he wonders if he has gotten stronger because of his leveling up. But he feels so agile and fast, almost as if he can do anything. He then kills the rodent to use it as a food source to eat. But the smaller the foe, the slower they will level up. That's where Tamiko explains that if he's gonna hunt, he should go for Ghost Wolf or a Blue Goblin because both of them are fairly weak, but will still allow Shu to level up quickly. She then explains to Shuo that there are three types of goblins, red, blue, and green. The blue one is stronger than the green one on the same level as a Ghost Wolf. However, the red ones are the most dangerous of them all because they are above level 15 and can also use their fungal abilities. The red goblins can also use fungal balls and sometimes carry out fungal weapons, which are both quite fatal for their foes. Shu gets curious and asks Tomiko if she can use any ability like that, but Tomiko says that she's just a squeaking female. Now, they are planning to set out on a journey to find a blue goblin or a ghost wolf. Three days have already passed and they didn't find anything. Shu is sleep deprived, hungry, and has all sorts of withdrawals coming to him. As soon as Shu is losing hope about finding the monsters, Tamiko explains that there's someone coming close to them. The ghost wolf and a goblin fighting each other. Interestingly enough, Shu is scared for his life and wants to fight, but he's shivering. Once they reach the place, they find out that indeed both the blue goblin and wolf are fighting. However, Shu is surprised to see how tall the goblin looks. However, the wolf is even bigger and Shu bets his money on the wolf winning the battle. While the wolf won, he was taken out by another enemy. This time, it's a red goblin that completely dominates. The red goblin uses fungal needles and completely destroys the ghost wolf, remaining victorious, but we have an even bigger issue at hand now. As soon as the red goblin, the stronger one, is doing his final move, the ghost wolf, even though it is full of pierced needles, eats the goblin becoming even stronger than before. Chu has doubts about his abilities on whether he would even be able to compete with these monsters and win. And now, he gets ready to attack the wolf while asking Tamiko to pick its bones after he has destroyed it. Chu is looking quite badass, carrying a katana while wearing a skirt. Well, that sounds weird, doesn't it? He is running towards the wolf while panicking, scared, yet full of energy. Right in the next scene, we see the wolf down on the ground completely dead, while Shu on the other hand is quite injured, and Tamiko is giving him some pep talk that he cannot die. He thinks to himself that while he is severely injured, at least the ghost wolf has died. But even with these injuries, he healed quickly and efficiently, which is what he is quite surprised with. Even Tamiko thinks Shu's healing abilities are just too good for his good. Tamiko quickly asks Shu that if he is healed, he should extract the sporangium and eat it while they are having an argument. They see the red goblin waking up and it survived the ghost wolf's attack. It is now very angry and is charging at Shu, but Shu has faith in his abilities. However, as soon as he draws the sword, he simply cannot. It seems like Shu's wounds haven't fully healed. Right the next moment, the goblin throws a hand at Shu, hitting him and putting him away with much force. He curses at the goblin monkey and thinks that even though this beast is heavily injured, the punch is enough to send him flying away, which is quite bad in this situation. But as soon as the goblin goes near to Shu, Tamiko comes in panicking, wanting to protect Shu. However, what can a poor little squirrel even do in this situation? Now the goblin is near them and is trying to pick them and destroy them. He somehow puts himself together and suddenly he sees blood appearing out of his hand. He is then stunned to see his ability and has a little clue what this thread is about. As soon as the red goblin attacks Tamiko, Shu throws a fungal fireball toward it, destroying its face. Poor little Shu passes out and sleeps like a puppy, but Tamiko feeds him with sporangium, which heals him and wakes him up in an instant. Now Shu has finally leveled up to level four and both are glad that everything turns out well. 
Around him, she sees a ghost wolf, a blue goblin, and a red goblin, all dead. He is in such disbelief that even though the worst situation happened which was quite life-threatening, he survived. He then thinks about his past where he was just an average man who was living a carefree life without much trouble. Tamiko is happy to see that they got so much sporangium. She gets a lot of enjoyment even in the worst of the situation, and Tamiko tells him about his fungal abilities. So far, there are two types of fungal balls. If you eat it, you recover, and if you throw it, it acts like a small bomb. He then thinks that when he threw the ball, it became a fireball, and that was surprising. He then gets happy and wonders if he can now create a fireball with his abilities. However, even with his abilities, he is in such a sticky situation. He hunts monsters but has no control over his fire. So in the end, he ends up burning most of his foes. Moreover, fighting and surviving every single day has become such a hell for him since he is packed with all the injuries. Jusen asks Tamiko if she has any abilities that would help him in battle, but she replies that she is just a squeaking little enemy and animals like her wouldn't even be good in battle. That's where Shu thinks, if Tamiko gets caught by the wolf, it would be difficult for him to protect her, and that's why she must be with him all the time. Tamiko then explains that there used to be one of the strongest beasts in this area, and if it was around, she would be turned into poop by now. However, as they are living and surviving, one day everything changes. They get a pelt, mushrooms, and sporangium, and it all feels like one big feast. As Shu eats the food, he feels the tingling sensation in his body yet again and feels like his back got hotter. It felt a little different from the usual leveling up, which stunned him. Tamiko is happy and surprised and tells Chu that if his back feels hot, then that means he has acquired a new kinyu, meaning a new ability that he can use in the battle. She also suggests to Shu that he should try his new abilities. But after he uses his new ability, Shu summons a very cool-looking shield that he can use in the battle to protect himself. He says that it feels just as solid as his fungal sword. However, it wouldn't serve him offensively but still help him in battle situations where he needs to protect himself. He then thinks about all the use cases of this sword and how he can use it with his enemies. For example, this sword can repel bite and claw attacks, and he can use it as a diversion in battle. And the next time he fought the battle, he didn't even get a scratch from the ghost wolf, which is crazy. Even he is stunned to see how strong he has gotten in such a short time frame. And even to this date, Shu keeps asking Tamiko about her power level, which she always avoids. But now, he is at level 7. After battling, Shu counts how many days have passed since he arrived in this abandoned metro. The number is 36 multiplied by 5, indicating that it has been half a year since he woke up in this place. Now, he's fighting the wolf once again, and while he is confident in his abilities, he strikes the ghost wolf to try to take its neck, but it bites its sword. Tamiko screams that there's a wolf behind his back too. Shu gets stunned and uses his fungal abilities while simultaneously killing the wolf that bit his sword with his sword. This time, our boy has a whole fur suit and not gonna lie, he looks quite handsome in this attire. Well, back to the subject in hand, Tamiko is stunned to see that this time, they didn't even hear the footsteps of the wolf coming from behind. After half a year, Shu is at level 17 and he has matured both physically and mentally, and after eating more sporangium. Just like always, Shu reminisces about his past, wondering how the hell did he get used to living in a place like this in just half a year? Now we finally get to see Tamiko's power level, and she is at level 14. However, Shu is at level 17, already passing her, which is just so insane. And even though he is leveling up quite heavily during this time, there's no outward change. In other words, this fungal parasite inside him got stronger instead of him. But even so, he thinks about all the awesome things he has created. For example, a bowl made of stone, a canteen to hold water, and clothes made of a wolf's pelt. But there is an even bigger problem that Shu might have to face now. He thinks that his power level might be too high to just kill these wolves and get a considerable amount of experience and level from them. Tamiko then proposes to him an idea. She asks him if he wants to up everything a notch and fight the newly born ghost wolf. These are new breeds of ghost wolves, but Shu thinks that their number isn't so small that he can exterminate them all by themselves. In this metro, there are many strong species like ogres, orthrus, and others, but Tamiko then explains to Shu that they could still fight the current level enemies and level up a bit more before taking it up a notch. 
and Shu thinks if he can get a woman that is in her 30s, they will try to start ascending. Well, you all know what this naughty guy means. Now, Tamiko explains to Shu that he is quite confident in his abilities, even though he is nowhere as strong as some of the enemies out there. But they should make the Red Goblin their main target since that is the strongest out of the current enemies that they are fighting. And Tamiko seems to hate these goblins because they are dirty, smell, and never shut the hell up. The resentment seems like it has been going on for ages since even before Shu they used to chase her. She looks at him with so much anger and says that she will get rid of these goblins and make sure they go completely extinct. This seems like a bit of a grudge, and although Shu is the one fighting, Tamiko gets the satisfaction she needs. So what do they do? Well, this time, Tamiko and Shuhu set off on a unique adventure which is going to the goblins hideout and fighting them head on. Is that a good idea? Certainly not. Will they do it regardless? Absolutely. But before actually attacking the hideout, they want to visit the village and gather some information first. While eating the sporangium, Shu gets another tingling sensation in the back, which means he unlocked a new skill. This time, he once again has a fungal ball, but this doesn't do anything. Shu wonders if it will work if he eats it, so he picks a rat up and feeds it, but he doesn't really notice any difference. He then takes the same ball and feeds it to Tamiko by force, but she loves it. She says that the taste is sweet and juicy and wonders if it's the same taste as what his mom told her about. He then eats the fungal ball himself, but really doesn't notice anything different. He just feels a little active. Then he explains that he has a total of five fungal abilities. The first one is regenerative filament, which allows him to heal at a much quicker rate than normal. Then there is the filament sword that he uses in combat and beats the hell out of his enemies. He also has fireballs that he uses often in battles to win. Then he has the filament shield that protects him from getting injured in countless battles. He's done since his inception in this world. And now his latest addition is the mysterious fungal ball, which doesn't do anything, but it seems to have a medicinal effect. The next morning, Tamiko runs towards Shu to tell him that some unicorns are here. He wonders whether the unicorns are very strong. But Tamiko tells him that even though these are the top tier beings on this floor, it doesn't really let anyone mess with it and unicorns usually just run away as they sense danger. However, if a unicorn becomes serious, one hit would mean death. He then wonders how much experience he will get if he eats its sporangium. But as soon as he looks at the unicorn, he gets scared and bails out saying that they should only inspect the goblin village today. On his way, he fights a ghost wolf and Shu is proud of himself for becoming so strong, but this time even Tamiko gets a level up. But it turns out that Shu still doesn't know Tamiko's official level, which for some reason she always hides. Tamiko explains to Shu that he should not ask a woman about their age and their level in this case. However, Tamiko is very surprised to see how quickly Shu powers his level up. She then says that he quickly passed him, which means she was wrong about his original potential. Tamiko then gives him more words of encouragement, saying that he should focus on becoming stronger as he has a lot of untapped potential. He then thanks Tamiko for all these power-ups, and Tamiko, being the little narcissistic squirrel she is, takes all the credit saying that if it wasn't for her, he would be a snack for wolves forever. Now, they go on to look for the goblin village, but this time Shu sees a unique flower and asks Tamiko whether it is edible. He touched the unknown plant and it bloomed right out, almost attacking them. But Tamiko calmed down, hit him, and told him not to touch plants he had no idea about it. This is a Beluran plant, a trap set by the goblins. The monkeys might already know they are here and could be coming this way at any time. As they are goofing around, suddenly he notices a strong aura. This aura is coming their way from a distance. And before we know it, he takes Tamiko, saying that they should run away from this pace as soon as possible. Behind them, they see a lot of goblins running towards them. One of these goblins is a red one, and fighting all three goblins would be quite a lot for someone like Shu. But as they are running away, they see a wolf joining the battle but get overpowered quickly by the goblins. Tamiko thinks that goblins are so cruelly strong, which is why she hates them so much. While panicking and running away from the situation, Shu thinks that they have to shake these enemies off and run away from the beast. Shu complains that they have ventured all the way into the hideout just to be greeted by these monsters, and they literally had no time to set up their plan. But as soon as they start to panic, the goblins surprisingly go away. What could be the reason? That is what Shu and Tamiko are thinking. 
But suddenly, Tamiko points at something. Shu looks behind to see a very intimidating monkey-looking creature looking at them with a tilted face. Tamiko is crying and in fear, she says it is Wraith, a monster that could be well over level 50. He then gets serious and asks Tamiko to run away so he can buy more time. But as soon as he says hurry, the monster comes close to Shu in a split second, surprising him. To counter this, Shu brings up his fungal sword. But in just a split second, it gets broken by Wraith's single attack, even sending him flying away from the place. That single attack was enough to break Shu's fingers, arms, and multiple bones, which is quite surprising. Tamiko tells him to get a grip and that they can survive, but the strong Wraith picks him from his head and he is terrified. He looks like he has seen a ghost and Wraith looks no different than one. Then Wraith puts pressure on his head, wanting to squish it, but Tamiko runs towards the Wraith trying to save him. With just a single slap, Tamiko seems to be done for. Away from the battlefield, she sits on the ground brutally. Seeing all this brutality here, he runs towards Tamiko to see how she is, but suddenly, he notices that he is missing his arm. The monster then attacks him from behind and tries to shove him in his mouth, but Shu sends some fireballs into Wraith's mouth in hopes of beating him. He then runs towards Tamiko and sees that she protected herself quite well but still got injured. He uses all his medicinal plants to ensure Tamiko survives, but it seems like Tamiko is just not waking up. He then wonders that when the beast got the best of him, he accepted his death, and if Tamiko wasn't there to stand up for him, he would be dead by now. However, now that he can heal himself as he pleases, he cannot use his healing abilities on others. He then uses his other fungal ability, which surprisingly cures Tamiko and she wakes up so quickly. Stuffing her mouth with mushrooms, she teases him just like always. It is revealed that the fifth ability of Shu is the fungal healing recovery ball. The liquid inside this ball heals others. But as everything seems okay and the new monkey monster has now been defeated, Tamiko apologizes to Shu, saying that there is something she hasn't told him. Shu looks at her with a curious face. What could it be, he wonders. Shu then asks her about what she hasn't told him. Tamiko then explains to him that when she met him, she told him that her mother had a partner. Basically, Tamiko was born five years ago and her mother died one year later, but her partner died on the 49th floor as well. Moreover, at that time, her mother was pregnant with Tamiko, who managed to run away, but it resulted in his death. Tamiko then explains that once he goes to the 49th floor, there will be a boss monster, and it is stronger than any Oni, Ogre, or Wraith. That monster is a true monster. Moreover, her mother's partner and the monster had a huge battle, but as they realized they couldn't really beat it, they went back. But even though they decided to retreat, they just couldn't. The entrance back to the 50th floor never really worked. So, they decided to take a temporary refugee on the stairway of the 50th floor and to return to the surface. The two of them planned to fight the boss, which went terribly wrong in their case. So, after a week of training, they decided to fight the monster again, but the hunter was defeated. Tamiko's mother then retreated to the 50th floor and gave birth to her. She got married, so that was the last time she was supposed to help the hunter. She wanted to meet Tamiko's dad and her husband above, so they thought that ultimately, they would leave the place together. Once they reach the 49th floor, they won't be able to return because the entrance can only be opened from outside. So in the end, they decided to let Tamiko go away and couldn't really return to her. Shu gets sad hearing Tamiko's story and how well she has been holding up for quite some time. But he also wonders what kind of a boss they are going to fight. Tamiko explains to him that it is a slime boss with a massive round shape, so no matter how you attack it, it never gets affected. Tamiko then explained to Shu that when she met him for the first time, she thought he was weak, and his spirit would break easily. He agrees with Tamiko and thinks deeply about his past. And that was the main reason why Tamiko didn't tell him about this situation back when they met. Because if Tamiko were to tell him about the bosses and everything, his spirit would break. Even to this, he agrees and says that he would have definitely folded to the pressure. Tamiko then goes on to explain that when his mom came to this place, she was at level 38. However, her human partner was over level 50, which was quite surprising. In other words, unless they become strong enough to beat all the monsters collectively on this level. They don't even stand a chance against the slime that is waiting for them on level 49. Right now, they cannot even beat a couple of red goblins, which shows how weak they truly are. 
After some time, Shu asks Tamiko about her injuries, and she says that she really likes the recovery balls and they work well. Shu then asks Tamiko whether she wants to go to the surface to meet her dad, and she says she wants to. However, she has also heard a lot about the surface from her dad. The surface is super pretty, all sparkly, and there are a lot of people, cities, and delicious things to each other. In other words, it seems like a full paradise to Tamiko, and she is most hyped about the sun, referring to it as a testicle. This squirrel had their own priority. I guess Tamiko is truly cultured squirrel. She then explains more about the surface to Shu, but Shu already knows everything since he literally came from the surface. Tamiko, even though she roasts the living hell out of him, says that she is glad that he is his partner. She then asks Shu about what he wants to do once he reaches the surface. To that, he replies that he wants to see everything from his eyes about what happened to the world. After that, he would love to go for some tasty stuff like yakiniku or ramen, drink some beer, sleep cozily, and watch videos on his smartphone. But above all, he wants to get married, and when he thinks about all his goals, he is more driven and motivated. Tamiko then says that her eyes are not wrong, and that if it's Abei Shu, he will become a great hunter. He then asks her that even though he is flattered, he's not the only hunter she's ever seen. She then explains that it's all because she's partnered with Shu and that she believes him so much. He then teases her by ticking but wonders how amazing it is that an amateur and a small animal survived in this hellhole for more than half a year now. And while yesterday they went through an even bigger hell, they should keep hunting wolves and goblins and someday they can get revenge on that stupid monkey. This is their long-term goal for now. To do that first, they would need to get more experienced in battle, and for now they should aim to get to level 50. Chu then thinks about his recent encounter with the Wraith Monkey and how he was traumatized by the event for a little while. However, no matter the enemy, he will fight and reach the surface regardless of his situation. Moreover, his plan incorporates reaching the surface with Tamiko. And if there's one thing we know so far, squirrels have bad luck when it comes to reaching the surface. And while she was thinking about all this, Tamiko says something so outrageous that it is enough to make all of us get arrested by the FBI. FBI open up! That is if we actually support their idea. Tamiko then goes on to explain that if she cannot find a good male partner and Shu is looking to get married, she wouldn't mind getting married to him. But with a straight face, Shu says that their marriage would be impossible and that Tamiko is a squirrel at the end of the day. As soon as he says that Tamiko attacks him from the most vicious angle possible. And now, we are given a very unique concept in the storyline. It's someone talking about how it wasn't until the fifth host that they developed an ego. It's a parasite we are hearing. This parasite's first host was a cockroach, and this parasite has only been accumulating the host's memories and copying their abilities. Furthermore, if the host died and there was a living being nearby, the parasite would simply transfer to the next host. For this particular parasite, the fifth one was a wolf. This host was bigger than any previous host, and the brain volume was a lot bigger. This was the wolf's parasite that died the previous day when Shu and Tamiko were being chased by the goblins. That parasite transferred into Shu the other day and was surprised to see his resolve while fighting the monkey. The parasite thinks about how impressive his new host was, who, without even an arm, was resisting a monkey, ultimately destroying it. Uh, that impact and the destruction of the wraith sparked a unique motion in this parasite, which ultimately made it move to the next host, which is a Bay Shu. Now, we are taken further into the storyline. It's been two and a half years since Shu and Tamiko first encountered wraith. That was a painful experience, but it helped them push further beyond the limits and become the strongest version of themselves. They are currently experiencing the third spring season, even though in Metro Utsuka, there are literally no seasons. A weird-looking bug monster appears, but Shu easily defeats it, and now he is finally at level 50. It took him two and a half years to go somewhere from level 17 to 50. Both Shu and Tamiko have been hunting consistently, and now he is tired. So before going to hunt again, he wants to go to the oasis to wash himself. As they are moving, they see the unicorn once again. As usual, Shu cannot hear its footsteps and wonders if it is the unicorn's fungal abilities. And even though Shu tries his best to make this unicorn open up, it still feels years away from greeting him. 
Tamiko then asks the most outrageous question about whether he's still a virgin. It is obvious that he is a virgin, but he decides to move on regardless. They are back to the oasis, and it is as beautiful as ever. He then remembers how they snuck into the goblin area before to think that there was a place like this. But this place is a grass-covered ogre plain. Ogres are the leading monsters on the 50th floor of Utstuka Metro when it comes to fighting abilities. Their toughness even surpasses Wraith, and they are quite intelligent, unlike many other beings on the 50th floor. Now, Shu Yu reveals his 10th fungal ability called Spores. These are super small particles that are invisible to human eyes, but once they stick for some time, they can create an outline which is quite useful for him since he can simply reveal the enemy. Once he uses this ability, he finds out that there's an ogre inside on the right side, and the other one is on top of the pillar nest. Aside from these two, his ability doesn't really outline any other monster in the area. So before they know it, they make their next move. The ogre is revealed and instantly, Shu thinks how good-looking a monkey this is. Shu summons his filament hammer, which is his sixth fungal ability. And even though he hit the ogre with this ability, it's ineffective against the wide stature. The ogre is coming at full force, but Shu is much more experienced, so he uses another fungal ability, which is jump. While the ogre is powerful, it just cannot meet the speed of Shu, and it is quite tired at this point. Suddenly, he uses his 12th fungal ability called the Smokescreen Ball. Then he uses his Spore ability to understand where exactly the ogre is, and uses his hammer smashing the living hell out of the ogre, ultimately putting it to rest. Shu then explains to Tamiko that it is such a beautiful place for the ogre, and it sucks that they have to snatch everything away from them. Tamiko then tells him that even though she is just eight years old and in her growth period, she seems like she's the same size as her mom now. He thinks about her mother and wonders if squirrel years are different from human ears. Tamiko tells him that she was leveling up slower than her and that she only had four abilities. But now Shu says something crazy. First, he reassures Tamiko that they are strong enough to kill even the strongest beasts at this level. But now they should take it up a notch and fight the best of this level, which is a boss. Or in their own words, they should at least give the boss a challenge. And Tamiko agrees. She thinks that even if they don't win against the boss, they can just challenge it, take all the information they can, and ultimately just run away. Tamiko then explains that Shu is as strong as her mother's partner, but even he didn't win the battle. While Tamiko is scared of the past and knows that her mother lost her partner, she agrees to the boss fight on one single condition. The condition was to kill the 50th floor boss. To this, he says that he never really knew that a boss existed on this floor as well. This boss is a stray metro beast that lurks in the darkness and seems very intimidating. They go to a shady looking place where water is leaking from everywhere. This place is like an underground waterway and Shu doesn't really know what is going on. It's because it doesn't make sense for a floor to appear in an underground metro. He then thinks about using his spores ability to see if he can find the monster anywhere. Moreover, Tamiko explains to him that he has heard the metro stray beast is at the same level as her mom's. Then we see Tamiko's stats. She is level 28 and has a total of four abilities. The first one is enhanced hearing. Then there's filament shell for her protection and there's also a level scouter for understanding how strong the enemy is. And lastly, there's super hardening that lets her harder the front teeth but Shu is at level 50 with a host of unique abilities that far surpasses what Tamiko has to offer. On paper, Shu is much stronger than Tamiko and can potentially beat the Metro Stray Beast. But what type of unique challenge will it bring? Moreover, Tamiko explains that this monster was supposed to be on the upper floor, but due to the dark slime, it cannot move up. So it stayed down just like them and became stronger slowly and efficiently. Suddenly, Tamiko senses the danger and Shu asks her to hide until it's over. Shu uses his fireball abilities only to miss it. The Metro Beast is revealed to be a bat creature and looks scary enough to even make Shu shiver in fear. Shu brings out his great shield, which is stronger than his previous shield. However, the Metro Beast uses its screeching ability to hinder Shu's ears and it is revealed to be an ultrasonic attack. Shu is quite surprised to see how strong this beast is. Moreover, aside from being strong, it was also very fast, making it a strong foe for even someone as experienced as him. He then quickly uses the smoke ball for a timeout to think about how to counter the ultrasonic waves. 
However, even after running away from the bat creature, the Metro Beast quickly catches up. He realized he messed up and that bats could understand sensory waves, which is why he got caught. The Beast uses his ultrasonic ability again, making him blind for some time. However, this time, he uses his sword only to find out that the Beast has some of the hardest skins in an enemy he has ever seen. The sword really didn't do much of a damage, and it seemed like a wasted effort on him side. Everything seems like a disadvantage for him, especially keeping a distance since the bat can use sensory abilities and ultrasonic waves to damage him. He then jumps right in front of the bat, then uses his seventh ability, Electric Ball. Interestingly enough, this attack damages the Metro Beast, and he then waves his sword to damage it further. However, he slashed the bat, but it was just not giving up. Now, Shu decides that he will put everything in his slash, and he cuts one claw of the beast. But the beast is still not ready to give up and uses more ultrasonic waves to disturb his senses. He has enough and he slashes it more, ultimately defeating the bat. Tamiko is looking at the full picture and says that she is proud of him and that he did a really good job. At this point, even though the beast is strong, he is even stronger and he proves himself to be worthy of Tamiko's respect. He thinks about how strong the Metro Beast was aside from its strength. It was very agile resilient and tenacious. Moreover, if they hadn't come here today, they might not have gained this experience. Now, it is time to take the sporangium from the bat. They just ate Bruce Wayne's balls. He gets ready to eat the sporangium in hopes of getting even stronger for tomorrow when they will face the slime boss for the first time. But Shu seems a little worried that his next opponent exists on the upper floor, posing a host of new challenges. Tamiko and Shu are getting ready for arguably the biggest battle they have ever seen. Undoubtedly, this would be what seems to be a life maker or life changer for them. As soon as he asks Tamiko about whether she's ready, Tamiko looks all gloomy, scared, and unfocused. He made her anxious with all the sudden plans, which is also normal, but he is a little annoyed because he went through all of the battles yesterday and destroyed the Metro Beast just for Tamiko to be even more scared. That's where Tamiko said her first sentence. She asks him whether he will not go overboard in this battle. He simply says that he knows that he won't. They set on an adventure with anxiousness about fighting with the slime. Finally, they meet a pack of Orthos that look quite strong themselves. Tamiko's third fungal ability is the level scouter that lets you measure the enemy's power levels. Until now, they have been relying on Tamiko's mother's knowledge, which has significantly changed because beasts are evolving. So in the end, they always get caught in the worst situations. However, now they can determine each individual's power levels using Tamiko's abilities. So Tamiko simply looks at the monsters and tells Shua that one of them is level 40, which is not really a threat at this point. And well, now full of confidence and experience, Shu easily defeats the pack because both of them don't want to be ambushed by more monsters and tire themselves before meeting the big boss of this level. After defeating these Orthos, they will go to the stairs of level 49's floors, where they might encounter something shady. Shu wonders whether the boss will chase them right through the stairs, but Tamiko has no idea what to expect anymore. Climbing the stairs brings him back to his salary man days. The stairs are quite long and they are constantly just climbing. Soon they see the entrance and Shu thinks that the boss might have already noticed their presence. He then takes Tamiko off his shoulder and tells her to just watch. But Tamiko is quite scared of everything and wants him to go easy and not go too overboard. She also asks him to just run away in case anything dangerous happens. As soon as he enters the level, he sees a huge slime that he doesn't even know has a face or anything. But one thing is for sure, this slime already noticed his presence. Soon, he gets attacked by something unknown from the ceiling, but he protects himself using his strong shield Moreover, it is very hard for Shu to protect himself because he just doesn't know where exactly the attack is coming. The way the slime boss attacks is so unorthodox that there's literally no primitive movement. It just comes and it just attacks him. He is then attacked with some sort of acid, but Shu still remains strong. Now, to take things seriously, Shu uses his fireball and electric ball abilities to attack the slime, but it comes right back to its original state that seems like the slime has some sort of strong regenerative abilities. Moreover, no matter what Shu does, the boss remains unfazed. But that isn't even the most worrying part. 
the boss can literally reach anywhere he wants without even much trouble. That's where Tamiko's input comes to help Shu in his pursuit of beating this damned boss. She draws the slime and tells Shu that even though slime is an absolute monster, its internal organs are in a specific area. If his attacks could reach the organs, he could definitely defeat the boss. So he simply throws his sword towards the weak point and it penetrates right through the slime. But something worse happens. The slime, instead of being destroyed, uses its ability to absolutely annihilate Shu, cutting his leg off. That's just the acid that came out of the slime's body. In a panic, Shu tells Tamiko that they should get the hell out of this place before things take a turn for the worst. Moreover, the main mission that they had is already completed. Shu has gotten a ton of experience from fighting the slime, which is what they originally aimed for. But as soon as he is running, Tamiko screams for him to take a look behind him. As soon as he seems back, there's a whole new acidic liquid coming his way, and he panics even more, thinking that he would be erased from existence if he's hit by this liquid. Shu then uses some sort of his ability, but is entirely engulfed in the liquid, worrying Tamiko to death. So what happened here? Well, we are now taken to the next scene where Tamiko is waking him up. It's all dark for him. He somehow survived the attack, but now they have to move down the stairs fairly quickly because the slime might make his next move. Tamiko tries to drag him down, but she is literally too small to even do anything. He then asks her to stop and that he will do it himself. Looking at him, he is completely burnt, like he just got cooked. He is also missing a leg and under complete scars. But since he took so much damage, Shu is not taking a lot of time to slowly recover. He himself looks stunned to see what a simple attack from that slime has caused him. But more importantly, the slime seemed like it didn't even use 10% of its power and did so much damage to him. Just how strong was it? He then thinks that it was a terrible last ditch effort and that he looks terrible now. However, he is focused on moving toward the hideout for now more than anything. He feels the hunger, the pain, the agony, and every bad feeling. And in his desperation, Shu slips and falls flat on his face. Tamiko made a lot of progress while he was out, but his dissolved leg and burnt skin are just slowing him down. Moreover, given how much time has passed, he should have been further in the healing process, but things seem not to be improving. That's where Shu has a crazy realization. He thinks that he has stopped recovering at this point. He sustained so much damage that his body stopped recovering. And if it does not recover, he wouldn't be able to move further now. In this desperation, Shu needs to eat something to enhance his recovery progress. However, he only has one thing in sight that he can eat, and it's Tamiko. While as brutal as it seems, it makes sense because otherwise he might die. But Shu is not heartless. He wouldn't eat such an innocent little cute squirrel, so he stops. But Tamiko tells him that he can eat her. She tells him that if eating her means he will heal, then she will be gladly eaten by him. She also wants to save him this time, and even if he is alone, he will get stronger and ultimately defeat the boss to move up to the surface. Hearing all that talk, Shu, even though he is in a terrible position, screams at her saying, don't be stupid. He then starts eating rocks and mushrooms, and then he asks Tamiko to bring him anything edible. And surprisingly, in no time, Tamiko returns with a dead goblin and a mushroom that he could eat. However, Tamiko herself is in a worse position because she hunts the goblin down by herself and drags him all the way from the original place. Shu panics and then starts eating to heal her. By using his recovery abilities, he cures Tamiko in no time. But thanks to her sacrifice, Shu was able to partially cure himself, his injuries, and his body parts. However, he says that if they leave this place, they will absolutely leave it together. Together, the two cute partners can overcome anything, but they weren't even close to being victorious with the slime. That's where Tamiko reveals something crazy. She says that the slime was level 70, while the last time Tamiko's mother told her it was at level 60. In other words, the slime has leveled up to a whopping 10 levels more during these years. Moreover, this floor is full of slimes, and thanks to their cornering different enemies, it seems like they were able to grow together. But more importantly, this slime is such bad news now because the level difference between him and the slime is a lot more. So, he wonders whether there are more slimes on the 50th floor, and Tamiko reveals that there are. Then he goes on to text the weak point, and he finds out that it is just like Tamiko said. They all seem to have similar weak points. 
more over to take revenge, both Shu and Tamiko team up more to increase their level. They are more driven than ever, and it was an experience needed for Shu personally to grow. They fight with all sorts of monsters, including the stronger ones. And now we are taken into the future even more, where two years have passed since they last met the slime. Now, Tamiko is at level 40 with a total of 5 abilities, while Shu is at level 65 with a total of 16 abilities. As he is sitting with Tamiko, he notices a unicorn. It comes to Shu for the very first time, and he feeds the unicorn with his recovery ball. The unicorn then licks Shu, which is a symbol that they have gotten fond of each other. However, Shu tells the unicorn that they might have to part ways very soon, since this is the way where he is going to take revenge on his arch enemy, the slime. He is going to the 49th floor once again, and if he wins the battle, they will go up. Moreover, Shu also thinks that as soon as they become friends, they have to part ways, which is quite sad. Seeing all his pep talk, the unicorn runs away and hits itself into the wall, breaking its horn. It brings the horn to Shu, which is another symbol that their friendship has evolved. The unicorn then goes its way and runs away. Now, Shu is even more motivated and thinks that since he received this gift from one of the strongest beings on this floor, it wouldn't be cool to lose to the slime. So what else? Are Tamiko and Shu gonna be okay? Well, they go to the 49th floor to see what has been going on in the slime world. Recently, they see monsters attacking the slime, but getting absolutely destroyed and cornered by the evil slimes. The slime engulfed and absorbed the wolf-type monsters and literally took every bit of their energy, leaving nothing but bones. Elsewhere, we see Shu and Tamiko getting ready for their big battle and getting the best of the slime. They're motivated to win this battle since it is the most important for them. He then tells Tamiko that this is the day when they will say goodbye to the floor and move to the next one. Tension is rising and they haven't really forgotten what happened to them the last time. The last time was nothing but destruction, but two years of hard work and Shu is now quite confident in his skills. Tamiko utilized her scanner ability to appraise the boss slime, revealing to Shu that it had reached a level above 70 higher than before. He seemed worried about this revelation, but Tamiko tried her best to motivate him, despite shivering. She assured him that they would always fight together. Shu, feeling encouraged, shared a fist bump with Tamiko, ready to engage in battle with the boss slime. Shedding his jacket and clothes, Shu brandished his fungal sword and shield. However, he couldn't help but notice that the boss slime appeared larger than before, attributing this observation to the trauma of the past two years. The boss slime attacked immediately, but Shu dodged in time and slashed at a tentacle, cutting it easily. This action revealed Shu's 15th fungal ability, Luminescent Spores, which enhance the sharpness and toughness of any weapon or shield it envelops. Then, Shu unleashed his 16th fungal ability, Fungal Filament Arms, creating additional arms from his back that wielded two more swords. Armed with a three-sword style, Shu was ready to face the slime again. As the boss slime launched multiple tentacles, Shu dodged and sliced through them effectively. He identified that the slime consisted of three different layers, the membrane, body fluid, and nucleus, with the nucleus being heavily guarded by body fluid. His strategy involved gradually cutting away the tentacles to reduce the volume of body fluid protecting the nucleus. Eventually, Shu's stamina began to wane, and he felt exhausted. Using a smoke bomb to create a diversion, he retreated from battle to take a break. During their rest, Shu and Tamiko discussed their strategy, noting the slime's decreased size and fewer tentacles. Shu planned to distract the slime while Tamiko looked for a switch to open a door. Shu pondered the potential abilities he could gain from consuming the slime's sporangium, determined to defeat the slime to impress Tamiko and avenge her mother. Shu re-engaged in battle with the slime boss for the third round. She was surprised that the boss slime didn't react as he approached, but suddenly, it used its tentacles to unleash a fungal ability, transforming them into spiked ball shapes. Chu dodged the spike ball and attempted to cut through the tentacle, but found it harder to slice than before. He realized the boss slime could only extend three tentacles at a time, and that their attack range was mid-range. Closing the gap to target its base, Shu managed to sever a tentacle. However, while focused on cutting one, the other two attacked him from behind. Using the arms on his back, Shu jumped and dodged the assault. Yet, the slime regenerated another tentacle and attacked with three spiked balls once more. 
Over time, he began to see results. The boss slime was shrinking due to the loss of some body fluid, allowing him to see its nucleus. He decided to end the battle with one decisive strike, but as he prepared to attack, the slime dashed toward him, transforming into a spiked ball, surprising Shu with its sudden increase in speed. He noticed that with every dash attack, the slime's body fluid gradually diminished. Planning to exploit this, he continued to dodge and launched fireballs at the slime, further reducing its size. The slime's movements became sluggish, and seizing the opportunity, Shu provoked it into another attack. As it lunged at him, he dodged and landed a perfect slash through the nucleus, defeating the boss slime. To ensure it was truly defeated, Shu approached the slime for a final slash, confirming its demise. Relieved, he collapsed to the ground in exhaustion. Tamiko, looking at the slime's body with a mix of triumph and anger, stomped on it, declaring, Serve you right, but no hard feelings. Gratefully, Tamiko thanked Shu for avenging her mother and hugged him. Together, they prepared to witness the sunrise, ready to move on from the battle. So finally, the tutorial cleared. In another storyline, we hear the parasite's voice. Together with my hosts up to now, I have battled with him many times. Every time I saw him, he got stronger and more beautiful. However, my host this time was very powerful. I was convinced that victory against me was not possible. But how? How? Even after the link with the slime was cut, I can still clearly picture that light he made. I want to meet him again. I'll go after him. If it's the me now, then I can interfere with the consciousness of small hosts. No matter how many times I have to experience death, I will absolutely reach him. Back to the main story. Upon finding the switch, Tamiko pressed it, and the entrance to the lower floor opened. Ends expected, defeating the boss and its sporangium increased their levels and granted them new ability. She reached level 66 with 17 fungal abilities, while Tamiko advanced to level 41 with 6 fungal abilities. Having conquered the most challenging level, they were determined to reach the surface. However, the journey proved to be far from straightforward. On the 41st floor, they were attacked by a violent wolf. Shu managed to defeat it, impressed by its strength yet acknowledging the challenge ahead. They faced numerous minor enemies that frequently drained their stamina. To take a break, Shu used his 13th fungal ability, Repellent Spores. As they ascended, the floors became increasingly cramped and their pace quickened. Twelve days had passed since their deadly battle with the boss when they reached the 20th floor. Suddenly, they heard noises above them, sounding like a fight. Using her keen hearing, Tamiko discerned a beast charging toward a human and identified the sounds as human voices. She urging him to hurry, they moved to assist the human. They found the human cornered at a dead end, with no option but to confront the beast head-on with knife in hand. Arriving just in time, Shu inquired about the human's condition. However, the human warned him to keep his distance due to the beast's danger. Tamiko assessed that the human was only level 20, while the beast was around level 40, making it unlikely for the human to win. She advised him to intervene. He hesitant due to Hunter's ethics against claiming another's prey, sought confirmation from the human on whether help was needed. Despite the human's initial refusal, soon began to vomit, showing signs of poisoning. With no other option, Shu rushed to the human's aid, using his shield to tackle the beast away. He instructed Tamiko to tend to the human while he dealt with the beast alone. He then drew his fungal hammer. As the beast charged, he blocked its attack with his shield, impressed by its strength. With a single blow from his hammer to the beast's head, he defeated it instantly. The human, though conscious, was immobilized. Tamiko wondered what they should do next. Now, just feed her with his balls. I mean, the fungal healing recovery ball? Seeking an herb to neutralize the poison, Tamiko suggested Shu use a specific ability. He deployed his 11th fungal ability, the green ball akin to a recovery ball, but with the added effect of neutralizing poison, as proven in their last experiment with a rat. He decided to try it, noticing the human's attractive face, which led him to momentarily question his preferences. Anyway, it doesn't look like a male to me. Reverse traps don't work on me. However, realizing this was not the time for such thoughts, he quickly had her consume the fungal ball. The woman slowly regained consciousness, surprised to see a man and feeling dizzy. He suggested she rest more, and upon her inquiry about the poison, showed her the fungal ball. 
gratefully, she ate it from his hand, expressing her relief and thanking Shu for saving her. Hearing a human voice for the first time in five years since waking up in this metro, Shu was moved to tears. The woman introduced herself as Ikari Noah, a hunter from the Ikebukuro tribe. Their introductions went smoothly, with Ikari showing no surprise at speaking to a squirrel, prompting Shu to wonder if conversing with animals had become common. Ikari thanked Shu for defeating the beast, relieving his concern about potentially upsetting her by interfering with her prey. She suggested they move towards a source of running water while dragging the beast, indicating her lack of strength to pull it alone. He offered to help, but while walking ahead, he accidentally caught sight of her prominent chest, I mean big heart, which surprised him. Ikari, noticing his gaze and realizing her mantle was misplaced, quickly adjusted it. Tamiko, feeling a hint of jealousy, reminded Shu that she was female too. Understanding the necessity of concealing her gender in a dangerous world, they proceeded to harvest the sporangium from the defeated beast. Ikari suggested they consume the sporangium. And while Shu and Tamiko accepted one, they proposed that Ikari take another. Watching Ikari eat the sporangium with evident joy, Shu found the sight odd, and fearing misinterpretation, chose to look away. Ikari's unexpected reaction caught Shu by surprise as she revealed her level had increased to 24. Tamiko, not to be outdone, proudly declared she was at level 41, impressing Ikari with a squirrel exceeding level 40 and prompting her curiosity about Shu's level. He disclosed he was at level 66, leaving Ikari astonished, noting such a level neared that of her master. Generously, Ikari offered the skin and meat of the beast to him, explaining that Catabolapis could be fashioned into hunter apparel and its fatty meat, rich in flavor, could be salted to make bacon. Eager at the prospect of bacon, Shu crafted a knife and inquired where to start cutting. Ikari, impressed by Shu's array of fungal abilities, speculated his class might be Holy Knight while she identified herself as an artisan. He, unfamiliar with these technical terms, seized the opportunity to share his backstory of awakening in the Metro, revealing he originated from a world a century past before dungeons and hunters came into existence. After hearing his story, Ikari was skeptical of his claim to have defeated the Satan Slime, a feat unachieved since its discovery 15 years ago. Tamiko corroborated their victory, mentioning Shu's vengeance for her mother. Seeking confirmation, Ikari made a small cut on Shu's hand with her knife, observing as it healed remarkably quickly. Noting the bluish-black fungal filaments accelerated the healing beyond typical self-heal abilities. Ikari speculated Shu might possess the immortal fungal ability, suggesting he could be the hero's vessel, the 13th Thread Reeler. Shu and Tamiko were confused about the meaning of Thread Reeler. Given its complexity, Ikari suggested they continue the conversation once they were outside. For dinner, they enjoyed a boar hot pot. Ikari shared that her reason for coming to this dungeon was to relish the food, recalling an unforgettable experience with a similar dish in Narima, despite a near miss with becoming prey herself. Shu prepared the boar meat while Ikari seasoned it with salt, wrapped it in herbs, and added beef steak mushrooms, known for their ability to absorb water from the meat. Ikari led them to a safe room on the 13th floor, inaccessible to beasts, where they could rest. Utilizing a fungal repellent, they easily reached their destination without attracting any beasts. Upon arrival, Ikari removed her mantle, and Shu noticed her huge heart. When Ikari inquired about his gaze, Shu awkwardly asked if all hunters wore jerseys. She explained that her orthodox jersey was inexpensive, resistant to stabbing and dirt, making it popular among hunters. He then went out to collect water. Tamiko expressed curiosity about Ikari Noah's trustworthiness. Shu considered Ikari a decent person, a sentiment Tamiko agreed with, trusting Shu's judgment. Returning, they found Ikari preparing the meal. The process involved dissolving miso in boiling water, adding seasoning, salt, and herbs, followed by vegetables, mushrooms, and meat. The boar hot pot was ready to be served. Seemed like she's a waifu material? Shu found the hot pot delicious, unlike anything he had tasted in a long time. Ikari expressed her happiness at becoming a hunter, which allowed her to enjoy such food. After dinner, Ikari offered Shu some coffee, explaining it was made from mushrooms grown in Narima. They roasted these coffee mushrooms and crushed them into a fine powder to brew as coffee. 
He found the concept strange compared to the coffee of his world, but acknowledged that the taste was indeed similar to traditional coffee. Ikari offered to help him learn more about the current world and the hunters, suggesting that possessing some knowledge about them would be beneficial. However, she recommended they first leave the metro to see the outside world, as it would be best for him to witness it firsthand. Grateful, Shu thanked Ikari who in turn thanked him for saving her. Curious about her age, Shu learned that Ikari was 18 years old. Nice, FBI won't arrest him. Pressed, he noted that despite being the age of a high school student, Ikari was already a hunter, leading him to reflect on what he was doing at her age. When Ikari inquired about Shu's age, he revealed he was 28 years old, to which she commented that he looked younger than his age. Tamiko revealed she was 10 years old, prompting Shu to tease her about wetting the bed, which resulted in Tamiko hitting him in the face in mock anger. After a peaceful chat, they prepared to sleep, extinguishing the fire for a good night's rest. Tamiko fell into a peaceful sleep afterward.